thank you. So we started Jethro's in 2008. Uh, it's just kind of a fun, different idea. I come from a fine dining background, but with the economy and the state that it was, we, we wanted to be able to reach more of our guests and do it at a more friendly price point. And around that time, barbecue is still a pretty new thing to Des Moines. There were some real successful places, but not anything where I'd call a barbecue culture. So we had a place that Drake picked out, and we opened Jethro's Barbecue, and kind of the rest just took off from there, from the TV shows and whatnot. But more importantly, let's talk about pork with it. So we're protein-driven restaurants. Barbecue concepts are protein-driven. Other than the traditional American steakhouse, I was really trying to think earlier this week on what do they actually just put more protein on the plate for, and that's definitely the barbecue concept. Um, some could say that barbecue started with pork. You know, the people in Texas are going to argue that barbecue started with cattle. Uh, I, that's not necessarily my 100% belief. I believe it did start with the hog, and I think that that's why we focus so much on that at Jethro's. Right now, we're purchasing around a million raw pounds of pork a year which I'm really proud of considering we have seven locations very centrally located in Iowa, six of which are in Des Moines alone, uh, and we take it very seriously. So uh, in order of importance, or at least by weight, obviously the pork butt, which we're using for pulled pork, uh, sandwiches are number one cut. We also buy, believe it or not, a ton of belly, usually in the form of bacon, um, but as people's tastes kind of evolve, which is good for a lot of people in this room, they're not afraid of eating pork belly prepared in non-bacon sort of ways, which I think is really exciting. And then, of course, the pork loin, and I'll talk about that here a little bit later. Uh, our number one goal, like I said, is gathering our pork from Iowa companies, and we've worked really, really hard. I can confidently say over 90% comes from Iowa family farmers. So that's from a chef standpoint and the economy of scale we buy pork from here. I, I think that that's a really, really good thing, and we worked hard to do that over the last five or six years. I know this is going to sound weird coming from a guy that uh, spent the last 10 years developing a barbecue concept and from a big, big purchaser of bacon, but I think the thing from, if we're going to talk about menus and where pork is going to go in the next 10 years, is I think we have to think a little bit beyond pit, barbecue beyond smoked flavors and about a little bit beyond bacon. And I know that really hurts because bacon's done a lot of amazing things for me. It's taken me halfway around the world to talk about pork, to talk about bacon. Uh, it's won me a ton of awards and lots of accolades. But that said, I think if we're talking about pork and how we're going to treat it in a restaurant setting, we have to be able to get people to gravitate towards different flavors with that. You know, when you talk about those flavors, you know, what's, what do we think commonly with that other than barbecue or bacon? Think about Latin American influences and how they use pork. Think about Asian, Chinese flavors and how they use pork and the different cuts that they use. Uh, in addition, you know, what are they doing over in Europe with it, especially in the Mediterranean? You know, people love to try new flavors, whether it's spicy and from the sriracha standpoint, whether it's just a different texture, you know, whether it's herbs. People need to be able to be more familiar with pork, very similar as they are with chicken. Uh, <clears throat> Another thing is just general preparation of pork. The number one way to cook pork at home is how? Grill. Grill, right? We have to get beyond that. If we don't, the perception of value of that protein is going to die with the Iowa chop or the pork porterhouse. You know, and from a restaurant standpoint, it's very, very hard for me to buy those products because when my guests can go to Fairway, and, and buy a pork porterhouse for $1.99 when they're on special, and they can cook it with their special seasoning and the way they like to do it at home, there's no way I can compete with that from a restaurant standpoint. And, and that will internally be hard. And, and that's where pork and beef become very different animals when we try to handle it from a restaurant situation. You know, when you're at Hy-Vee or Fairway and you see that porterhouse that's beef and it's $25, they understand that that's an expensive piece. You know, but we don't have a lot of cuts of pork when we go to a, a retail setting that work in that same sort of scenario. Th this continues to drive our innovation of how we can get pork and make sure that, that it's better. Everybody follow me on this? So what works in our favor in the pork industry, or excuse me, from, from pork producers, what works in our, my favor is a restaurateur? Uh, cuts people don't want to cook. You know, luckily, most of America is not cooking at home anywhere near where they were even 10 years ago. 
people don't know how to cook. You know, I have friends where I've had to teach them how to cook a steak other than on a grill. Like the simplest of factors. You know, so much detail that goes into, they just never seen it. They never saw their parents cook. So they're, they're afraid of things. They're scared to death of ribs. I'm very, very glad for this. I, I can't tell you the last time I was ever at a home barbecue and somebody was trying to cook ribs. They see them in the grocery store. They see that they're kind of expensive. They're very afraid they're going to mess them up because I'm sure one day they had a rib that wasn't good at all, and they don't want to be the person that does that. You know, pork butt's the same way. You know, when, my, when I have a friend that says, oh, we're going to smoke a pork butt, and I'm just like, why are you going to do that? You know, you're, you're going you're to spend $14 on charcoal, and you're going to watch your Weber grill, your trigger, or whatever you're doing with that to really end up making, like, enough sandwiches for 10 people. It seems like a lot of work. You know, that sort of thing plays in our favor from a restaurant standpoint. But we constantly search for in what, like, when I work with the national pork uh, producers and the Iowa pork producers, they always ask me, how can we sell more pork loin? You know, that's basically the boneless, skinless chicken breast of the pork market. You know, how, how can we get people to gravitate towards that cut? There's a decent perception of value in it from a retail standpoint. Uh, people aren't necessarily that afraid to cook it, as long as they don't overcook it. And what can we do as restaurants to actually make people appreciate that cut? That, that's what I see as our biggest challenge from people that love pork. Uh, luckily, we're in Iowa, other than maybe Ohio, there's a, we're in this pocket where people eat these pork tenderloins, which are delicious, but I never saw one of those sandwiches until Iowa. You know, how can we find more things like that? Where, where can we take those kind of cuts and make them better? Can we cut them into strips? Can we turn them into fingers? Can nuggets and so on and so forth with that? You know, from a menu innovation standpoint, that's what we work on with that. Uh, I had the opportunity to go over to Japan a few months ago, and one of the number one cuts that we used was the pork loin, trying to create a sandwich that people thought was unique, where texturally it was really appealing and that really we could feature the cuts that we need to, so from an industry we can keep growing. Lastly, from a, just a menu standpoint and a restaurant standpoint, what do I see as a positive? So years and years ago, we opened an oyster bar in Des Moines, Iowa, the very first oyster bar in the state. Uh, we sell a ton of oysters, more than you could probably ever imagine, in the Midwest from a place that's basically scared to eat seafood. We saw an opportunity in, about, in 2007 that we started to experiment with them on the menu. More and more people are eating it. And I'm not talking about a restaurant that's selling two dozen oysters a day or three dozen oysters a day. I'm talking I sell 1,100, 1,200, 2,000 oysters a week on the half shell. And what uh, we believe allowed people to, to get into this more was the sushi craze. When sushi actually made it to middle America and people weren't afraid to eat raw fish, they then became not afraid to eat oysters. I hope with this large charcuterie movement that again it started in the west coast really and then now the east coast and it's very popular in wine bars, middle America, you can go to a full service casual restaurant now and get a cheese plate with different kinds of sausage and, and unique things like that. I hope that people's familiarity with that will then turn their taste to looking for more fun flavors with pork. You know, if, if I was going to pick out one full service casual, a high-end restaurant trend that could help the pork industry, the charcuterie movement is that. You know, and if we can take a bigger picture in that and we can eat, get people to eat more fresh sausage, not just breakfast sausage, everybody loves breakfast sausage, but more sausages on a bun in restaurants above and beyond the brat, that too could be a very, very big thing for the pork industry and help better utilization of the hawks. So from my standpoint of being a chef and loving to work with pork, these are the trends and the things that I think are going to be very important leading us forward. Thank you very much, Dominic.